postcard, but it looks okay. So we're like, eh, it's fine. Ooh. person with us um, mm -hmm. and all the many people who are online watching this is a streaming uh, program. Um, so this is our chats on the past program. And this mm -hmm. is a program um, that's usually only virtual. Uh, we're having an in-person uh, part of it today because of our very, very special mm -hmm. guest, Cheney McKnight, my mm -hmm. good friend and colleague. Um, so Chats on the Past is a program where we speak with experts in various aspects of public history and history at large, authors, artisans, um, interpreters, um, across every kind of discipline you can imagine. We've had uh, archaeologists who are experts in, in, uh, in early 20th century costume. We've had uh, restorers of tombstones. We've had uh, you know a variety of people. And of course, now we have Cheney. Um, just a couple of housekeeping uh, details. This is a free program. We're always pleased to offer free programming. I just do want to mention to everybody here and everybody online that uh, the Westport Museum for History and Culture is not an agency of the town of Westport, nor are we supported by the town of Westport. So we appreciate any and all donations. There's a donation box in the front on the lobby, uh, on the desk, and of course online at westporthistory.org donate. Any little amount helps. And of course, if you can't, that's okay too. We're happy to have you here. So at the end of our program, we will take questions uh, in person and I think maybe online, Kat, is that true? Yes. Yeah. So people online certainly feel free to put, put in your questions. Uh, we'll read them out loud and answer them. So tonight we have Cheney McKnight, mm -hmm. uh, who's known for her online work at uh, Not Your Mama's History dot com and on YouTube, Instagram, mm -hmm. TikTok. Um, Cheney is a public historian and interpreter of American history. Mm -hmm. She brings to light the histories of those who have traditionally been enslaved, uh, erased from the historical record, often enslaved communities mm -hmm. and early free communities from, who, from whom she has descended mm -hmm. and um, the generations that have followed. Cheney is also the manager of living history at New York Historical Society's Domena Children's Museum. And we're mm -hmm. so happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Thank you for you. having me. Of course. <laughs> um, so actually, you're going to do your, your work more justice than I can explaining it. <laughs> so uh, it would be great for people who, don't, who aren't as deeply familiar, mm -hmm. if you could tell everybody a little bit about what you do and what Not Your Mom's History focuses. Oh, that is such a big question. Know, because sorry. we no, no, we do a lot. <laughs> um, so I I like to put it in buckets. So we have a bucket for uh, social media. Um, a few years ago, my main goal was to connect specifically with young folks about history and making those connections with them in a way in which they're going to listen, but also not just young folks, but people who would not ordinarily go to a museum to an exhibit about enslavement in this country. I wanted to uh, connect with people um, who um, don't, who haven't been to the African American Museum in DC and make those connections and have conversations that many people may not be having. Um, so um, I, we uh, started a series on YouTube called These Roots, 
where we explored a day in the life of a black person, whether free or enslaved, uh, in the 18th or 19th century, and that did very well. Um, as, as of now, we have around 4 million to 5 million views on that, which I'm really excited about. Um, and we got a lot of great feedback from that. And then um, I'm constantly connecting with people and posing questions on TikTok and Instagram where the young folks are. My nephew gets really annoyed with me because I use ticker talk. <laughs> Apparently that's not cool enough. <laughs> now, um, so we have the social media bucket. Then we have uh, the in the uh, interpretation bucket. So Not Your Mama's History also goes from site to site interpreting, uh, but not just interpreting, but also guiding sites and telling stories, whether training staff, in order to tell more complete stories. Um, and um, I think that that is the hardest part of my job because it is very delicate work. Um, it's building trust, it's building bridges uh, and uh, just like swooping in. It's a, in order to make lasting change, um, there, there has to be uh, communication and build is building uh, bridges built. And then we have uh, the, we have social media, we have um, and then, work. Oh, oh yes. And then activist work. Um, and so I, I don't necessarily like to call it activist work because it, I'm still just interpreting. I'm still mm -hmm. just ed educating the public. Uh, things like the Let's Talk About Slavery Table, which we'll talk about more later. Um, and uh, Slavery Made Plain series that we did. Um, so really engaging people on the streets um, and providing a source of information um, that is not connected to a historic site or an institution, which will make it more accessible to more people. And also, I would say those are kind of the three pillars of uh, what we do at Not Your Mama's History. But there's, there's so much that like is in between the pillars, right? Mm -hmm. Like we actually, uh, Westport Museum for History and Culture and Cheney and Not Your Mama's History are now producing a three-part series, mm -hmm. uh, Black Women's History series focused mm -hmm. on Connecticut in this area um, for which we received a generous grant from Connecticut Humanities mm -hmm. to produce and that'll be released over the next year. And so it kind of melds, it's, it's somewhere in that interstitial place, right? It is video, which is a sweet spot for your team, but it's, and it's storytelling. It's not quite exactly attached to any particular site. It is in some cases, in some cases it, is, right. it isn't. And I think in my experience working with you and the team, it's that, um, that willingness to be creative and open-minded about how to get to mm -hmm. a very, very difficult topic for many people to, to understand. Um, and so toward that end, what I want to ask you, I mean, I can answer it for us a thousand times over, but I'm going to ask you, what about pushback? Have you experienced pushback and then kind of okay. what forms and mm -hmm. is it different if you're doing, yeah. you know, a um, let's talk about slavery table mm -hmm. versus being at a site doing mm. interpretation? Yes. Yeah, so I do get a lot of pushback, um, but I think uh, with any problem, you have to approach it one problem at a time. And every interaction I have is very unique. And you have to, in order to be a good historical interpreter, number one, I always tell my interpreters, you have to like people. Um, <laughs> you also have to be a good communicator and uh, want to understand people. Um, because my belief is that most people that say something that is that hurts my feelings and is wildly problematic, it is not because they are coming from a place of malice, but because most people do not have a degree in Africana studies and they don't have the correct language. Um, and so it's also, um, I would say across the world, people are very ignorant about the histories that allow us to live very oblivious lives. Um, so the privileges that people have, they aren't even aware of it. And they don't even understand the, the history that brought them to a place 
that they have positive interactions with police and public officials. Whereas uh, I was just having this conversation yesterday with Jerome, uh, my business partner, where just asking for directions, um, I it would never occur to me to stop and ask a police officer uh, for, for directions. Um, not because this person is right now threatening my life, um, but because of the um, history that me, myself and my community have with police officers. They are, do not appear to me as a, a safe source of information. Uh, they're always, to me, a potential for harm. And so um, it is a long history that got me to the place I didn't wake up yesterday and say, I don't like interaction with, interacting right. with police officers. It's a lot of history that got us there. Um, so um, I, I think that handling each interaction and underst really understanding ignorance that gets us there. And I know that when people hear ignorance, they're like, oh, that's such a negative word, but it's really the lack of knowledge and understanding and understanding where people's holes are is where you can say, this is where I can uh, put some information here to help you bridge um, why you think that, um, for example, the conversations we recently had around Aunt Jemima mm. and how people, many people found it just um, surprising that uh, I would be upset if someone called me Aunt Jemima or said I look like Aunt Jemima and really establishing that Aunt Jemima was actually a minstrel show character. She is not based on a real person. Uh, there were real women who portrayed her um, in traveling shows or demonstrations for Aunt Jemima pancake mix but she was not based off of a real person. Mm -hmm. She was based off a menstrual show character. Mm -hmm. And so really providing people with that information can then help them understand why saying something like, well, what's the, what's the matter with uh, Aunt Jemima? It's, a, it's, just a, it's just a product, but it's actually a menstrual, black-based menstrual show character, so much so that her catchphrase was actually from a blackface menstrual show. So, so it by educating people about that, it's it can make connections and be, and then it also opens up right. their eyes even further because then they realize that there's this whole character that an entire sex, section of the population found offensive and knew for years why it was offensive to them. Mm -hmm. Whereas the rest of the world was like, I don't know why you all are upset about it. I like it. Yeah. And I would make the argument the rest mm -hmm. of the world is is being subtly given a reinforcing message. Yes. Right? Because we've been that, saying it for many years. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So just having that product in your mm -hmm. house growing up reinforces that it's okay. A big corporation put in front of you. Right? So, mm -hmm. um, and you know, we have this conversation all the time about the work we do here. Mm -hmm. um, and I know the work you do at New York Historical and that we've done together, and that is kind of trying to address true lack of knowledge, mm -hmm. ignorance around enslavement in the North, mm -hmm. which was, yeah. you know, it lasted a very long time. Mm -hmm. In the state of Connecticut, only 17 years short of uh, the end of enslavement in the South. Mm -hmm. um, and it, and I love when people tell us, it had to be better, right? No, it wasn't better. <laughs> Maybe a little different, but not better. Um, but it's this idea, right? And and we don't blame anybody who comes here and doesn't mm -hmm. know that because mm -hmm. how many of you were taught that in school, mm -hmm. right? That there was slavery in Connecticut and New York State and New Jersey, you mm -hmm. know? So, um, mm -hmm. and of and course, yeah. Right, right. So in every one of the original 13, as we approach the 250th yeah. anniversary of the right. Declaration of, of Independence. So, um so with that in mind, I have a two-part question for you. So you are now the, the manager of living history mm -hmm. at New York Historical Society. So I would love for you to talk about that a, a bit as a role, mm -hmm. but really what I would love for you to talk about is something that um, is a question in our field a lot, and that is um, the seemingly 
um, interchangeable terminology around living history, right? Mm -hmm. People will say living historian, mm -hmm. um, they'll say historic reenactor, mm -hmm. they'll say historical interpreter. Mm -hmm. um, and we talk a lot about these yeah, are not necessarily all the same things, right? Yeah. And living history as, as a field mm -hmm. that requires management yes. um, is a specific thing, trying to yeah. achieve a specific thing. Um, can you talk about that? Yes. Uh, so the two part question, uh, Tay, I will forget the last part of the question, okay. so I'll need a <laughs> reminder. Uh, the first part about the difference between slavery in the North and the South, um, there's a few things going on there. What I hear a lot of people saying is uh, only a small amount of people own enslaved persons. That is true in the South, in the South right. and more rural areas. But then we also have this in the North more broadly, there was a lot of people who owned a small amount of people. Mm -hmm. So in the South, slavery was just a very few, very wealthy people who owned uh, tens or hundreds of people and places in like New York um, and even outside of, of, uh, of um, urban areas mm -hmm. like New York City, even outside of urban areas. Uh, we noticed that in the North, um, it was more middling class. Mm -hmm. So um, whereas in the South, it was really um, industry based. So uh, tobacco uh, and then later cotton or sugar cane um, and a lot of hands are injected into it. Whereas up North, I find that it's more of a status symbol. So um, one or two enslaved persons in a household um, who are um, a lot of times a maid of all work. So doing an enslaved person who's doing, um, have their hands in many different areas. But also this is kind of like, I can afford to purchase a person. Um, this is not someone who's a piece of property that your livelihood is based off of. Usually that's not the case unless they are, in a trade shop. So we do see a lot of enslaved persons in trade shops like blacksmithing, mm -hmm. uh, coopers, uh, joiners, but um, even dressmakers. Mm -hmm. We were talking about mantua mm -hmm. makers as well. Um, but you primarily see them as uh, uh, um, household servants in, in northern places. To your point, in, in Connecticut, most of the enslaved people, the largest majority of enslaved people their enslavers were judges, ministers, yes. doctors, and lawyers, right? So these were not people mm -hmm. who were benefiting from the immediate yes. labor for their own exactly. livelihood, right? Yes. Um, in places mm -hmm. like this, where the farms uh, that were here were provisioning farms for the West Indies, yes. you did have a little bit more agricultural mm -hmm. labor among enslaved people, yeah. but exactly right. Like yeah. in uh, Van Cortland uh, Park in the Bronx. Right. Um, I call that a plantation. That is an example of a a northern plantation where there was a large amount of enslaved persons um, doing farm labor on a s larger scale specifically to sell mm -hmm. the product in mass. This isn't a local op small operation. Right. So I would consider that to be a plantation. And the primary purpose of that property wasn't as a home, but as a plantation. Uh, but, Phillips Manor Hall, Phillipsburg Manor, Phillips, these are all Manor. very similar. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so um, I, I, I know for the longest, uh, many people consider it a kinder, gentler type of slavery because we do have that buffer, that little bit of a buffer between the end of slavery in most northern places and the end of slavery collectively at the end nationally. of the yep. nationally uh, at the end of the Civil War. So um we have that gap where we can say, oh, look at us. We may have no. slavery up here. Um, uh, uh. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> exactly. right. And then I do remember question, the difference between a reenactor, living historian and historical interpreter. Right. Okay. Um, so this is very interesting because one of my goals, long-term goals is to establish historical interpretation as a career and a career path for people. Um, and there's a transition now of many historic sites and museums 
um, really attempting to pay historical interpreters um, a wage and uh, a livable wage where you can actually do this work and do it professionally and do it well. There's professional organizations. I know we have interpreters here. There are actual professional um, organizations, um, the National Association of Interpretation, and you could be trained and certified in interpretation. Um, so I would consider historical uh, interpreters to be a time traveling guide um, and in many different ways throughout different landscapes, um, historic sites, even on the streets, um, in museums. Um, they are guiding people through these spaces uh, and objects and exhibitions. Uh, then we have um, reenactors. Uh, reenactors are people who are just uh, reenacting historical events. That is a huge umbrella. Um, living history is uh, very similar as well. I, I was trying to look for a uh, definition across the board. Um, a living historian is someone who um, talks to people about events of the past or uh, history, uh, about history while wearing historical costuming. Um, so for me, historical interpreters, um, you do not uh, need a costume. Um, and my goal for most of my interpreters that I train is, oh, sorry, I'm touching the mic. <laughs> sorry, y'all. Um, <laughs> my goal is that they do not need a costume to interpret to the public. It is just co costuming and historical clothing are a tool. Um, yes, people may love them. I, I particularly love historical clothing. Um, but it is a tool that I use to engage with people. Um, it is not something that um, I am wearing for uh, when I'm wearing historically accurate clothing, which is not a thing. Um, I, I really try to make sure that I'm doing it, using it as a tool and not some fantasy. Um, if I want to do that, I get together with my squirrel friends and we go to a um, and we go rent a cabin and cook in a fire. Mm -hmm. That's what th that's where that should be. But when interacting with the public as a professional interpreter, interpretation comes first. And so that's why I personally. Uh, so when I came into position of living history at New York Historical Society, I uh, changed the name from living historian to historical interpreter um, because I wanted to make that distinction. Um, and reenactors, generally reenactors are hobbyists. Um, I, I started out on the hobby side, so I know. Um, but you know, there are there is no standard definition, but I kind of pulled I over the years I pulled um, both reenactors, living historians, and historical interpreters. And this is kind of what we kind of came up with. Uh, and living history is slightly different from, uh, living history is just the umbrella term for all the crafts. And so by um, sewing a historical garment, even if you're wearing jeans and a t-shirt, that is living history in and of itself. If you're doing it on an original, a sewing machine or sewing it by hand, that is you are doing living history. Um, there on South Street Seaport, there is an awesome print shop um, in lower Manhattan and they use all of the, I think it's an 1820s press. It's so cool. And they, um, and they actually operate as a modern business and everybody's wearing like polos and I just, it really blew my mind because I looked in there and it looked like a living history space. But then I saw people like on cell phones and that just was like, I, was like, I thought that was really cool. You know, I, I often think that about, um, I don't know, people don't know this about me, but I, you know, as a culinary historian and as a chef, yeah. the fact of the matter is 
working in any restaurant kitchen mm -hmm. on the line, it is living history because that methodology has not really changed. Right in probably over 200 years. Some of the recipes are exactly the same. Right, and the methods, and also the way you interact mm -hmm. with each other, mm -hmm. what your role is and what you're supposed yeah. to be doing and so on. Um, but mm -hmm. but let's talk mm -hmm. about, um, let's talk about uh, the fact that you are known for, mm -hmm. for your clothing, um, the beautiful mm -hmm. ensemble you're wearing today, you had mm -hmm. made, right? Mm -hmm. And um, often crosses this mm -hmm. kind of um, historical clothing, mm -hmm. pl becoming modern, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I have seen you uh, wear clothes from the mid 18th century, all the way up to the early 20th century, portraying, mm -hmm. not portraying, um, interpreting mm -hmm. suffragists, mm -hmm. black suffragists. Mm -hmm. And um, tell me how people react to you? And do they react differently? I know you said it's a tool. But yeah. I'm, you know, and I've mm -hmm. seen these reactions, but yes. it's different than experiencing the reactions. Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> it really depends. So um, I would consider, so the clothing that I'm wearing now, these these clothes are for me. This is uh, solely for, to feed my soul. Um, when I look at historically accurate clothing, um, I particularly do not like wearing them. Um, because that is, again, a tool, but it's also the way people interact with me. Mm -hmm. um, for many people, this is like, they. I've noticed how people interact with me. They interact with me differently. Um, my body is no longer my own. People touch me yeah. without permission. They're, they invade my space. They talk to me differently as if I am not... Um, a modern person um and how and how they believe would have been appropriate yes to absolutely speak to per, a person in the roles absolutely. that you're portraying especially sites that or in, yeah. or interpreting rather sorry yeah. you know yes mm -hmm. right it's like it's almost like people take leave of their senses yes. and they <laughs> think oh we're we're now in 1799 yes. and i'm one kind of person you're another kind of person mm -hmm. I'm going to step into mm -hmm. that. It's like, no, please don't yeah. do that. You and, do, you don't. and I think yeah. it's also because there's a fantasy world yes. many sites like to create yes. where you go in and you're transported to a long time ago. Mm. And that can be uh, problematic because, number one, it is impossible for us to be in the past, mm -hmm. fully transported. Um and so for me, my question is, why even try mm -hmm. to transport people to the past? Instead, utilizing scenes like this with additional interpretation to take people's minds uh, to a place where they can understand the past. I At no time do I want people to look at me and be like, oh, I'm in the 18th century or the 19th century. Mm -hmm. um, I have failed. <laughs> People right. are transported to the past. Uh, and I'm hoping that through costuming, I can use it as a tool for people to see the textiles of the past and clothing construction, um, but also to, um, in many ways, to provoke their um, a bit of emotion in seeing me in a space. Right. That's a really good ways. point because one of the things that we talk about a lot here is that the people who lived in the past were people who lived in a world uh, that was complex, just like our own, right? So in this mm -hmm. moment, we're sitting here and talking to each other. Uh, we have we're all experiencing the drastic effects of climate change. Mm -hmm. There are fires raging in Canada. There's a war in the Ukraine. Right. You know, there's an inflationary economy. And we know about it. And we know about it, right? right? And we talk about it. And we mm -hmm. live around it. And then we have the pressures of our work and our families and what's mm -hmm. going on in our own households. So did they, right? Yes. And we yes. think about uh, history as a timeline because mm -hmm. that's how it's taught to us. But, you know, I assure you, when the American Revolution was going on, the people who lived in, in Fairfield County were not only thinking about the American Revolution. You know, they were thinking about their crops failing and their daughter who has to get married right. and right. a million other things, right? And to me, I think historical interpreters like yourself um, sort of literally bring this idea to life, 
Mm -hmm. Right. So if this can allow someone to think, oh, my gosh, someone who lived 200 years ago was an actual person. Right. I think that opens a lot of doors for Absolutely. for understanding or kind of a, for addressing ignorance. And that's also it's it's difficult because um, it really highlights um, how people feel about modern black people. Mm -hmm and about black folks in the past. Mm -hmm. um, when they see me um, and the way in which they in interact with me, um, many people see enslaved persons and black folks of the past as a side character or support character to the main characters or to the... Um, to the yeah to the main characters mm -hmm. of the story in history mm -hmm. and um i know many of us think differently but as someone who interacts with people regularly um people primarily think about those who would have had money and those are the main characters that they think about and then everyone else populating the that scene are just the side characters. And so when they go into a space, a historic site, a lot of the pushback I get about the changing narratives, the way in which we're interpreting history is because you are ruining the scene. You are right. ruining the I scene thought. that I had in my head right. and, the, right. and the magic that I got the first time I came to this museum. Right. And when I looked in and I saw George Washington and Martha, and here you come <laughs> saying that we all were people here. No one was the main character. Mm -hmm. George Washington is not the main character. Mm -hmm. Everyone had a hand in making this country what it is. Right. And uh, also like kind of something that also is like a, a record scratch is when I say that without uh, enslaved Africans in this country, there would not be a United States of America. True. We would not have won the American Revolution uh, because they, France just would not have come in, even though they love sticking it to England. That was <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. They they love it. <laughs> they would not have done it for free. Okay, mm -mm. if we could not show, right? Oh, <laughs> right, right, right. They just wanted they wanted money, but they also the side effect, the nice side effect, was they got to stick it to England. But like primarily, they were like, "How are you going to pay us back for this?" Right, and without a large population of free labor. I mean, just the money, uh, just the uh, the money that it, the population, the enslaved population was worth was enough collateral to bring them in on the war. And uh, we know it was a investment that they got paid back for. A hundred percent. I mean, here in the state of Connecticut, collateralizing black bodies in the mm -hmm. South built the insurance industry. I yes. mean, that was mm -hmm. Aetna's biggest bu business, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, no, that's, that's and, and it's right. When people, I mean, we deal with that too, you know, the kind of pretty view of history when it's, people feel it's been taken from mm -hmm. them. Yeah. There's, a, there's, there's almost like a visceral reaction to it. It feels like you're, you ruined, you you're ruined, ruined it. it. You, you ruined, ruined it. it. Right. So I think that's where a lot of the pushback yeah. Um, it's coming from and then really providing people with the documentation to say the history you were told, the interpretation you were right. given was a lie. And there's no, I don't, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. The history I was told was a lie. Mm -hmm. It was, for example, if you go to Colonial Williamsburg and you look at the population, it is the most of the interpreters there are white. Mm -hmm. but Williamsburg would have been almost 50% black mm -hmm. the time. So there's no way you could have just floated down the street in 1762 right. and only saw white people. Right. In fact, you would have seen more black people because during the day, those would have been the people right. working out in the back. Right. Right. So it would have been almost all black on the street. 
But when you go as a visitor to Colonial Williamsburg, you don't see indigenous people. Well, once uh, at maybe at two o'clock mm -hmm. in the afternoon yeah. or a designated spot, you will see indigenous people. Uh, and in a few buildings, you may see some black people. And that's, you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, it's also it, entirely too clean. You know, right, like right, 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 right. Yeah. So the past was nasty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the past was nasty. So I, you know, what I would love for you to talk about more is something that um, we we think about, we talk about, we sh I don't want to say struggle, but we think about how to talk about this. Mm -hmm. And this is this idea of being you. You touched on it, an activist historian, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I think about our colleagues up in up in um, Massachusetts. Uh, at the, the Royal House and Slave Quarters. And they mm -hmm. have right on the front of their website, if you don't know this site, go look at their website, Royal House mm -hmm. and Slave Quarters, just outside of Boston. Um, and they, their tagline is right on the front page of their website, museums are not neutral. Yeah. Right. And we we believe that. We do not believe we're neutral. Right. right but right. And so, you know, we kind of think of ourselves in a way as activist historians, but you touched on the fact is it's not exactly what people think. We're not going to go out with signs. Right, right, right. We're not going to interrupt town meetings, right? right? Mm -hmm. It's about how we interpret mm -hmm. and present primary source-based fact right, right, right. Um, unrelentingly. Yes. I, yes. So it doesn't matter if people don't mm -hmm. like it. These are facts. We will present them, right? Yes. Um, I, I would like you to talk a bit more about mm -hmm. that in your work, you know, mm -hmm. because... Like, I think a little, we shy a little bit, a, a little bit away as like, mm -hmm. we don't want to call ourselves activists, but we are. Yeah. Well, I, I, I definitely yeah. consider myself to be an activist, um, but I, I shy away from calling the let's talk about slavery table activism mm -hmm. because number one, um, I specifically make it so that this is not a gotcha table. Right. This is purely an educational table. It's meant to... I place it specifically at certain times in certain places where people are relaxed. Like in New York, I don't put it in touristy areas. Mm -hmm. I put it in places where there is a large intersection of different people. Uh, I sometimes go Sunday after church when people are kind of moseying about and more willing to stop and have a conversation. I put it off the beaten path so that people feel more secure coming up to me and talking to me instead of putting it like in a flashy place and having a, you know, we come from a time where everything is content mm. and everyone's trying to grab content in order to, you know, get those clicks, get those likes. Um, and a lot of people, uh, I know some of my followers get frustrated that I don't post a lot more, but a lot of my interactions with people are very, intimate and sensitive. So for example, I've had people tell me that they've, uh, when they were a child, they were taken by their family to a lynching. Uh, so just someone disclosing that to, to me, um, I would never put that on social media or put a hidden recording device or anything. Um, so there, there's that, but I do think that it has the potential to change minds. So having the Let's Talk About Slavery table where I have laminates and QR codes linked to actual evidence, and then with them, I can talk them through and say, uh, and just be ready for any type of question or comments people have and just take the time to unravel because it's a knot. So remember when you get um, a string or something knotted up, if you're just like, oh, I've got to get it out. It's not, it gets worse, right? <laughs> it's worse. Um, really interpreting the people about difficult topics is like unraveling a knot because I first, instead of putting information on top of it, that's just adding more knots, I have to slowly actually take a time to look at the knot and see where it is and slowly pull it out each knot at a time. And so that's me dismantling what they were told mm -hmm. in school or from family that, and, and people aren't maliciously telling children lies. Okay. There are some people who are maliciously <laughs> telling children lies, but I would say generally as an educator, 
I have said um, early in my career, I did say things that weren't true that I found out later that mm. wasn't. And I unwittingly shared untruths with people. And so I have to also go back through and untie it and on and not those things. And then once all those are unknotted, then we can start adding more information. So I think half our job is just. I mean, I agree with you. And I think that there's, uh, especially certainly what you do, I have to say, I often think of Chani as my second daughter. And when she's like, I set up a table, like, at 110th <laughs> like, Street, I'm doing? like, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> right? And there's a lot of bravery in doing that, to go out there alone and to do it. But there's also a lot of bravery in being able to say, you know what I told you before? I actually didn't have the story right. Oops. Um, you know, we, we had an exhibit here where we, um, without getting into it, we had to uh, amend something we had in a text panel. And rather than reprinting the text panel, we covered over the, the information, put a QR code, and it said, why is this covered? And with the QR code, mm -hmm. that led to our website to explain that we were wrong. We've yeah. been corrected. Here's the information. Mm -hmm. Because we're hoping that if people, if we can do that, then people will also feel brave yes. to say, I, I, you know, I actually didn't get that right. Yeah. You know, and within proper information, yeah. I'm willing to go there and yeah. unravel that knot. And we're also on top of that, we're also having to educate the public on how to have conversations. Right. Um, I know like the tension right now is just so high and understandably because there are so many things, you know, I personally feel attacked. Um, but at the same time, um, in order to make progress, we've got to talk to one another. Mm -hmm. And so um, one thing that I teach people is to come to conversations unarmed, whether I say by the, uh, by the verbal or physical kind, come unarmed. I come unarmed, uh, meaning that when I enter in a conversation with someone or interpretation, I am not trying to harm someone. I'm not trying to beat them with the facts. Um, I'm trying to share and educate. And I think a lot of times when we go into conversations with people, we unwittingly, because of the pain that we've suffered, because of the tension all these things have put on us, we have come to these conversations with weapons of the verbal kind where we're just like, ah, I can own you with this. And, um, and also just as a descendant of ancestors, who were so wronged by this country and people who are still continuing to be wronged by this country. It is very hard to put down my verbal weapons mm -hmm. because I'm very good at using my uh, words to harm people. But it, it is an active choice to choose peace. It is a choice. It's a choice to hurt people. And so that's also something that we can look on the past and say, it was a choice for these people to do X, Y, and Z. But today we can do differently. And I know that, uh, you know, uh, people worry that uh, children will be, mm. will feel guilty if we tell them this or that. Um, I find that the chitlins, they are very smart. The Shetlands these days are just, they are really Well, smart. because you know, the thing is, <laughs> children have visceral reactions to wrong. Yes. And they just immediately are like, what? Wait, what? <laughs> like no. the little girl who tried to rescue me. Yes. There's a little girl at yes. Colonial Williamsburg. Yes. Uh, she was very young. Uh, they started, uh, it was at the beginning when they were really trying to change their narrative. And so when they introduced everyone to what they were going to see at the site. Um, they established there were enslaved persons and they showed a picture, a, a painting of an enslaved, a group of enslaved persons. And so the first place this little girl, her parents take her is to the Peyton Randolph house where I was interpreting. She looks in and she's like, oh, there's a slave in there. Dad, 
well, you got to save her. Mm. You got to save her. Right. And she had, she came up with a whole plan. She was like, you need to pull the car around. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and it was like, we had to like stop the whole tour, like, because she was just very upset. Right. Because in her mind, this was very clear. This is an enslaved person who, ens- you all told me, you all told me slavery was wrong. You said it in the presentation and then y'all brought me over here and now I see a That's slave right. and I'm trying to save her and you all are just acting like this is normal. Right, <laughs> right, right. right. And right. so we had to convince her. I pulled out my license. I was oh. like, here are my keys. I, I, I can, can leave. Anytime. I can quit if I want yeah. to. And then she was like, okay. She was like, the car is still out there. <laughs> right. So, but that really highlighted to me just really children. Yeah. They everything that that's icky with adults, that is learned, that is right. taught. What yeah. I always think about with that story is the part where you always say, you know, and all the adults are acting like it's normal. And it always makes me think about what we all have experienced. Mm-hmm. People coming saying, but that's just the way it was. Right. It was normal then, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and that's very difficult to unpack for adults. Yes. Yes, but it no, it wasn't normal, you know. Mm-hmm. It, it was a, it was a, it was a circumstance that everybody, mm-hmm. uh, s- some people agreed to participate in, and most people were forced to participate in. It, right? right, right, right. Um, but that idea of like, let's not pretend that this is a normal situation in the course right. of human history. Children get it immediately and viscerally. Yes, they do. And to your yeah. point, adults are are talked out of it, talked yes. out of that visceral yes. reaction. We're talked mm-hmm. out of it over time, right? And, and it's that magic of uh, childhood. Uh, I, I love like with Peter Pan and the imagination of children. It's not just the imagination, but how they see the world is so, I just say pure, but in a way it's just very clear. And it's our circumstances that, uh, and our experiences that make us jaded or, make us see the world in a different way. Also our biases start to come in that are learned. And then we, it's not just, oh, this is right and this is wrong. We put so many conditions to say, "Hmm, it seems wrong, but X, Y, and Z. Right, we create a cognitive dissonance. I mean, Mm -hmm. we talk about this all the time. We talked about it in fact today that, you know, so, you know, my father was an American. He was from Trinidad and, the reason I understood that something with this whole construct of how American history was taught as a very young child, eight years old, was because we went to Mount Vernon. Mm-hmm. And he was like, there is something very wrong here. Like, yeah, and I'm not going to get into the whole story, but it was my father who was like, this is nonsense, right? Yeah. And the way you're presenting this is completely like, untrue. How you could be on a whole plantation and not mention and, slavery And not mention at slavery. All. And because this was in 1976. Or mention it in certain places. In certain places in passing. And he was... He was, you know, very, very offended. Mm-hmm. But he is of his perspective was a as a person from a majority black brown country. So mm-hmm. he was like, "What's what's this nonsense?" And because of that, as a young person, mm-hmm. that helped mold, you know, my my view of it. So I think so. This like cognitive dissonance of adults or mm-hmm. lack thereof mm-hmm. is is kind of what then brings children into that fold eventually. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to switch gears and talk about something that I know is very dear to your heart. Um, oh. And that is, is something that actually you are among the early, in my opinion, and, mm-hmm. and I'm not an expert by any stretch of the, on this topic, but in my opinion, you're among the early adopters of, and certainly one of the earliest, continue to be the earliest adopters of in the, in the historical interpretation field, and that is Afrofuturism. Yeah. And how to bring Afrofuturism and the interpretation of history. It feels mm-hmm. like a futurism history. How does it go to right. um, can you talk about what Afrofuturism mm-hmm. is? Yes. How <laughs> it works with the mm-hmm. interpretation of American history through the black mm-hmm. experience mm-hmm. and being a historical interpreter. Yes. Uh, so Afrofuturism is a uh, speculative speculative futures through a black lens or a uh, through the lens of someone a part of the African diaspora. Um, And what I saw from this, I always consider myself a futurist, uh, which may be surprising because I'm also a historical interpreter, um, but I'm always living in the future. And uh, the reason why I can live, uh, 
not live, but look back on the past and live in the future uh, is because of something called Sankofa. And uh, essentially is go back and fetch it is a uh, African uh, Dinka term. Um, you go back in order to have a prosperous future, you have to get the lessons from the past or you will not prosper in the future. And so I see that a lot, uh, very present in America. But the thing with um, Afrofuturism is it is through a black lens. And so it is centered solely on black individuals in these spaces. And so for me, it's more of speculating of how preservation will look in the future uh, through a descendant as a descendant of, uh, uh, of enslaved persons. Um, and then also um, really using my interactions at historic sites as a healing tool for descendants. Um, I do something called Afroterpreting where the public learning something is a side effect and not the purpose of it. Uh, the purpose of Afroterpreting is to uh, center Black voices, engage in spaces, um, and heal oneself um, by going back and fetching um, and bringing it forward. So um, whenever I am in these spaces, I am not trying to um, reinvent the past or recreate the past. Um, but imagine the future of um, where we can be if we uh, get it right. right. You know, we're messy. We're never going to get it right, but, you but, know, do our best. <laughs> right. And it's part of what you're saying is, is, is moving who gets to be the central character, right? Yes. Moving the lens on who gets yeah. to be the central character. The thing I love about the concept of Sankofa is also is applied to history, right? Mm -hmm. And it, yeah. not just, you know, learning the past, and bring mm -hmm. it forward, but this idea that nobody gets left behind. Yes. So th those of you who don't know, the image of Sankofa is a bird that has an egg on her back and she's turning oh. back to retrieve the egg. So, oh. and the idea is nobody gets left behind. I have a little, um, I have a little one right here on my on little this. birdie. Yeah, it's, it's a very, very back. specific like yeah, image. I know it's you tiny. <laughs> look it up. Um, yeah. Here at the museum, we actually, uh, for those of you who don't know, are engaged in a, in a very big garden renovation project right now of our property. That's endless, but we won't talk about that. Um, <laughs> so, but we moved uh, memorial bricks that we installed uh, after our award-winning exhibit in 2018-19 called Remember the History of African Americans in Westport. We moved those bricks to the front of the property, right in front of the house, recentering the story, the history and in the middle of this memorial area where there will be a bench, um, we have a bird bath. And the reason is very specifically to, to hearken the idea of Sankofa, because Sankofa mm -hmm. is, is uh, represented by a bird, right? So mm -hmm. that's why we have that there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's an image I love. I think it's really important. Yeah. Um, and it's funny, I find a lot of Africans are very confused. Uh, by many Americans inability to be at peace with their with or find some type of peace and understanding with their past right. um, because it's very interesting many African countries have apologized for their hand in slavery and yet here in America there's just just this very, and I think it's because of this constant idea of Sankofa. I know that's a very specific uh, culture that Sankofa comes from, but right. I find that the idea of Sankofa runs through many West African countries and in general African and, and, countries. And also many, many, many ancient cultures, yes. right? Like yeah. the, the uh, indigenous ideas of seven generations back and seven generations forward. Mm -hmm. It's also a Buddhist concept, right? Um, so you can't just live in your present moment and think everything starts yeah. and ends here because it doesn't, right? And that's yeah. that's where we get misunderstandings about yeah. history. And there's also uh, this idea of um, 
karma and reconciliation and making amends. So um, many, many cultures around the world believe that um, you are cursed if you do not make amends for wrongs done generations into the future. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is uh, really coming to the forefront. And uh, I hate to use words like curse, but it's kind of the first thing that kind of comes. Well, you're going to continue doomed. to replay yeah. this, this sort of, this, we see it in America, the systemic effects mm -hmm. of enslavement and uh, uh, racialization um, are embedded into the, the, our, our, our cultural systems and people continue to suffer today, right? Mm -hmm. Until it is solved, until it is addressed, people will continue to suffer today Absolutely. and everybody will continue to suffer not just you know Absolutely. you know people of color versus white people right. we are second, all on the same boat we're all you on the know same i boat. always use um the analogy that as a country i should say as a hemisphere because yeah this hemisphere really depends on uh united states of, of america getting the things together because if we fall it's bad news for a lot of people. So I see United States of America, this hemisphere, we're all in the same ship. And if we harm another person, it is just if I want to harm anyone else, I'm in the bottom of that ship drilling a hole yeah. into the ship I'm standing on. Right. I'm That's like, right. wait, what's wrong with you? Right. <laughs> like, right. you're, you're trying to sabotage and harm other people. We are all on the same boat. <laughs> this yeah. is us. <laughs> like, right. This is our boat. Right. Like, let's not right. do not that. that and so that's why I think um, I think that's the most important thing that we have to drive home uh, for everyone, especially the young folks, that you're not lobbing cannons at the ship across over from us. You're you're harming yourself. Right. Um, and, and that's difficult because there's also the level of pain and hurt mm -hmm. and to still be, uh, it's very difficult to come face to face with um, uh, when you may not get the justice mm -hmm. you think yourself or your uh, ancestors deserve. Right. Right. Yeah. And to still go on and do the work, right? Yes. It's, it's not easy. So I know that we're coming uh, up to or close to our time, and I know people may have questions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll start in the audience. Does anybody have any questions? And then I'll let um, Kat. Mm -hmm. Are you going to go visit the new? Yeah, I would imagine if there is. Oh, that's interesting. interesting. It's a, neither of us know about that, so we'll have to yeah. like, dig into that. That's <laughs> right, surprising, right? right? That is very surprising. Like, like, did you hear what yeah. so-and-so is doing? Are like, we? I mean, I mean, we're really tapped into the community because, yeah. like, uh, whenever I mean, even small museums yeah. and really small places become. Like the National Museum for African American History. Yeah. Mm -hmm. we'll, be, well, we'll look into it. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. I'm speaking for you. We'll look into it. Claiborne. Yes. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. Definitely. We'll take a look. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. No, no, no. It's okay. Well, fine. Anybody else in the. Yes. Um, yeah, I have a question. You were saying that um, you dress so, uh, you know, the costume school, mm -hmm. and because we want to help people to heal. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if you could tell us mm -hmm. what's the end of the world. Uh, so I'll start with an example. Um, when I start, first started uh, reenactment, so on the hobby side, my very first reenactment was Gettysburg 150th, which it last month marked my 
10 year anniversary, I actually went back to Gettysburg for their 160th. And the 100, 150th, we went as the free black people, myself and four other reenactors went as the free black people of Gettysburg. And um, usually at reenactments, there's a scenario, you interact with people. There was a town in Gettysburg, which is essentially a bunch of canvas tents that we pretend are buildings. And there was a scenario where the Confederates came into town. And all of a sudden, all the Black people just got up, started packing up their stuff and running out of town. Um, Leading up to that, for like two, three days, we had been interacting with other people in the town of Gettysburg, including children. And we found out later that some of the parents were very upset because uh, for the first time, they had to have a real conversation with their children about the Confederacy uh, because they were asking their parents, why did Miss Cheney and Mr. Marvin run away from the good guys? And so for the first time, they had to have a very critical conversation about why certain people would not want to be in town with Confederates. And they were quite upset. And so I, I saw the potential in living history and, well, historical costuming specifically um, to make connections. Um, and to evoke thought um, and even emotion. So through that, through interacting with me, they keep, those children really were like, but wait a minute, what happened? Uh, and so from that, I kind of saw that. Also, the young girl who saw me in historical clothing it was like oh my goodness and i think yeah. i think just from you know working with you for years and hearing you speak i think that the concise answer to the question you're asking is not that it is a specific feeling but it is to feel yeah right because it's one yeah. thing to be told history on a page yeah. in a book even in a museum where you're mm -hmm. looking at a you know a two-dimensional display <laughs> and you may not feel any kind of way about it right it's just information that you're given I think just from working with you, it's not that you're trying to go for a specific okay. feeling. You just want people to yes. feel something in their heart, something, something about what you're telling them. Yes. And it may be very antithetical to what you yourself yeah. feel, but at least it is a genuine reaction. Yes. And then, uh, and at times to evoke those feelings, uh, because sometimes I think people have numbed themselves. Right to a lot of historical narratives and things like that. And sometimes that is the wedge that I need to get in to have a more critical conversation about, about slavery, about the past. Um, there, we can definitely have conversations to uh, the ethics of that by using visual trauma to uh, provoke thought. Um, I have, you know, I have different feelings about it because um, I even question myself a lot about costuming, about clothing, uh, especially historical clothing, just because. Well, we had this discussion people. with our video series, right? Yeah. We had a long discussion about yeah. it. Is it that you should be wearing the clothing of the period of the women you're interpreting? And ultimately, we mm -hmm. decided no, yeah. like you should wear. Um, your own creation that has an Afrofuturist aspect mm -hmm. to tell the story of these women because yeah. you're not trying to embody these women, yes. right? Um, yeah, that's what I, for me, first person, I, I really dislike first person interpretation. Um, why don't because, you explain what that means? It's essentially oh, pre pretending to be uh, that person. person. I'm yes. so and so, and this is my, right? Yeah. So, really pretending to a, be a person of the past um, because I think also sometimes with interpreters and reenactors, they get way too in it mm -hmm. and they really start to get lost in the character and it becomes this um, ego driven situation. For example, when I go into some historic sites um, in which people enslaved persons would have been cooking on the hearth. You would not believe 
the feelings of ownership. Some, some historical interpreters have with the hearth because they were embodying that person and not actually off of actual documentation, but what they think that person would have been like. Um, and I'm like, no, in this hearth, this is actually my enslaved ancestors would have been cooking in this hearth at the time. Um, and so I, I think that sometimes people get lost, in it, but also it is not a good representation of the past um, because you cannot see the full extent of a human being through five minutes of mm -hmm. interacting with a doppelganger mm -hmm. of that person. I don't care how good you are. An and no living person, no living yeah. person can, no living person today can possibly fully implicate, yeah. empathize, understand yes. what it meant to be enslaved yes. in that period of time. Yes. Uh, or or can, can be somebody who died 50 years ago or 100 yeah. years ago. We can't. We because live in our own time. You know, we, we can live be in a place now where we are, we have an immense amount of freedom. I, one of my pet peeves is when uh, specifically interpreters say, oh, we know how mm. they felt mm. back then. There's no way you can ever feel what they felt because um, number one, before you even put on the clothing, you would have had to live years under a system of oppression, even just being a person, being a white male farmer in the year 1742, you would have had to know your place in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it would have you would have had a completely different mindset. So it just boggles my mind that people could put on some clothes and say, I, I know. know. Yeah. <laughs> right, because the social structures, they don't exist today. Yeah. Not even as also, you said. Also, I went to the dentist, so. Yeah, like, there's that. that. There's just that. My teeth don't hurt right <laughs> now. Exactly. At least. Oh, just one more. Um, I, th I think uh, it, it really, I find that a lot of times costume interpretation is unreliable in storytelling because you never know what people are taking from it. Mm -mm -mm. Because many people may just take, this is a wonderful scene. It reminds me of Gone with the Wind. And then other people take what I'm hoping they'll take away, the lessons they'll take away. Um, so I think uh, that's why, for me, it's unreliable, mm -hmm. um, but it's a tool that can, when directed appropriately, can be very much useful. So uh, you just had your hand. I'm just curious. Uh, I, I used to teach history at a college, and one of the things that my students would always come back at me with, you know, I talk about India and uh, the, the British colonization and stuff, <laughs> they would always say, well, I never would have done that. I yeah. never would have done that. Yeah. How do you respond? <laughs> Um, I think uh, primarily just explaining that you don't have the mindset, exactly what we were just talking about. Yeah. You don't have the mindset of uh, people of the past, but in reality, you absolutely could do that. Mm -hmm. uh, it is so easy. I mean, um, I, I don't consider myself to be a violent person or someone who would like to just go around hurting people. But there's absolutely times or what, remember what I said, verbal weapons where I have hurt people with my words, um, where intentionally done so. And so there is absolutely, we are all capable. That's the reason why I teach 
these things because no matter how far we think we are away from the past, I, I hope that everything that's gone on in the past five years have taught us at least that, that it we are just two steps away from re-enslaving people, which we are. Because if you look at the 13th Amendment, we are enslaving people in this country. And if you look at the direction in which um, corporations are able to purchase the time of prisoners yeah. to do certain work, and we're starting to see them at work sites in places like, I'm going to not go there, but, <laughs> but uh, replacing certain labor that is forced out uh, so being replaced by prison labor, we are already redoing slavery. Yeah, and for-profit uh, prisons, for, for right? For-profit. I mean, which many, many prisons in America are, right? right? And so we yeah. we are already, we are already, and how many of us are up in arms actively saying no and really out there because I get a lot of people, especially young people saying, I, I would have, I would have saved everyone. I would have free. I was like, how many of us are at the Southern border right. leaving food for people? Right. How many of us are leaving blankets? How many of us are leaving water? That doesn't mean that we have to interact and guide people to safety, but I don't see anybody out there. That is the equivalent right. to people who had the, the courage to aid and abed runaways because it was a federal crime, just That's like right. it's a federal crime now to support uh, people seeking asylum here in the United right. States. So when I, I kind of look at it, it's a tiny, teeny, tiny portion of the population who would have had the courage. So yeah. when people are saying, oh, I would have done this, I would have done that, I wouldn't have done that. And I'm like, what are you doing today? You know, mm -hmm. I, I often say to people who say this to me, mm -hmm. you know, have you ever, even young people, walked by a homeless person on the street? Did you lean over and say, hey, let me take you over to this coffee shop and buy something to eat, right? And you have your reasons not to. They mm -hmm. looked scary. I didn't, I don't mm -hmm. know them. I, what if mm -hmm. they hurt me? Whatever your reasons are, you had your reasons, right? And the reasons who did what they, the people who did what they did in the past, believe that they had their yeah. reasons, right? And so if you talk about human experience being very similar generation to generation, um, none of us, none of us can say what we would have, wouldn't have done, mm -hmm. right? Or what we yeah. would, or how many times are we surprised? Like we see footage of something happening on the, on the news, something shocking happened and everyone's just freezing and then people being right. like, I, I didn't know what to do, right? Because right, right, it's right. human nature, right? Right, right, right. right. So let me uh, just ask Catherine, is there any uh, questions online? Okay. Um, I actually don't want Afrofuturism to be melded into the professional scale, and I'm already seeing this um, that there are sites as well as organizations that are trying to meld Afrofuturism into interpretation. Um, let me make this very clear that it's an appropriation of Afrofuturism. Without Afrofuturism coming from the minds, um, the free minds of a Black individual, it is not Afrofuturism. It's just not. It's just... <laughs> And um, it is just, it is very disheartening. The many sites and organizations who have um, started to use Afrofuturism um, to market things. Um, and I do not, I don't own Afrofuturism. I'm an Afrofuturist, uh, but I don't own it. But uh, I stand on the shoulders of many um, Afro, other Afrofuturists that I really look up to. Um, there are many books that um, I will post. I will post on my social media um, a list of the books of, with this, awesome this authors. Is, so yeah. the interesting thing is that you know Afrofuturism, as I mean, it's not a discipline per se, but as an exploration, 
has gone on for some decades. Oh, oh, for many oh, decades, yes. right? It's, it just sort of yeah. didn't have a, 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 a like a, a label associated yes, with it, right? Absolutely. I mean, you could say the Harlem Renaissance was Afrofuturism or, of the time, well, in, a, in, in a way, right? I, I would say there were some artists who were Afrofuturists, who, who were Afrofuturists, yeah. and who yeah. had a you have to have a future, far flung future. Um, uh, speculative lens. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yes. Yeah. And so yeah. I would say, yes, there were, there were artists some, yeah. that I would label as Afrofuturists. And I, I feel as though I, I stand on their shoulders. Mm -hmm. um, and I would really stress, I'm already seeing some people, like a site attempted to recreate one of the dresses that I made to give to a Black interpreter um, I consider these dresses that I make, um, I purposely, I made it with two purposes. For myself, to create something that I believe if my ancestors had access to unlimited resources, what is something that they would have wanted to make? Um, and number two, I was hoping for a cultural costume for Black Americans or uh, people throughout the diaspora. And so that was specifically my goal. And to see historic sites attempt to recreate it, I do not consider that to be mm. something like uh, a compliment. I, 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 that angers me, it frustrates me, it hurts me. Uh, so that's, a, that's just something I just wanted to kind of make clear. And this is not something that I'm like, I want it only for myself. Um, this is something that I created also as a gift for other Black interpreters and and other Black Afrofuturists um, to partake in. And so that's just... Uh, yeah. Can I just say one tiny positive thing about costume? Mm -hmm. Janie and I worked at Keeler together mm -hmm. for an all too short time that she was with us. <laughs> um, and we used to wear colonial costumes. And I had this little girl, she's like, you talk about little kids, mm -hmm. she was about seven, and her parents had just taken her to see Hamilton. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, are you crazy? You paid 1200 bucks for the ticket for the seven-year-old, you know? <laughs> so she, she knew mm -hmm. the whole thing. Yeah. And she, mm -hmm. so here I am in my little garb, and she says, did you know the Schuyler sisters? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I had put her, I thought, oh, well, she's right back mm -hmm. there. You know, yeah, 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 yeah. Right it felt very there. real to yeah. her. Yeah, I'm yeah, sure. I wasn't trying to interpret anybody specifically. Yeah, just, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Sort of think, but what a yeah. sharp little kid. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think uh, children are able to, uh, you know, they see different connections. Mm. Yeah, and that's why she was like, "Oh, that reminds me of." Yeah, yeah. it's it's a I'm very sorry, clear connect mm -hmm. line mm -hmm. to the, to a child. Kat, did you have any? Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. So I think we'll we'll close our program. Um, I'll encourage you. First of all, thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you it's much. always a pleasure. <laughs> it's funny, Jenny and I spent many hours talking to each other, and I always think, well, we've exhausted that conversation. Right. We, we have nothing else to talk about, and it, that's never true. We we could talk for many more hours. <laughs> that is true. So I appreciate you. Thank you for being here with us. Thank you. Um, I encourage everybody to come and visit us, please. Um, we have a wonderful exhibit called Legacy, the Adairs of Westport, mm -hmm. um, about a black family who lived in Westport for almost 100 years and built quite um, sort of a mini empire um, uh, descended from the patriarch of the family who we believe was enslaved in, in, in the Carolinas. Um, and to see our brick installment, our memorial installment, the Remembered yeah. Bricks, um, and, and enjoy our garden if it ever gets done in my lifetime. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Certainly.